Hey, welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, part of the High Tech Development Corporation and Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Can't believe I got that all out in one breath. Anyway, thanks for being on the show today here at Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, yesterday we had a, another Think Tech event, actually a Think Tech slash Hawaii Energy Policy Forum event at the state legislature. And yes, January means it's time for the state legislature to kick off. And this one is uh, being right after an election year, probably going to be a little slower than the ones that where folks are sitting in place. But our, our topic this year, and Jay Fido wanted me to kind of go back and, and talk a little bit about what we did yesterday, was we had several of the specialists or subject matter experts for several of the bills that have turned into laws over the past decade or two and go back and revisit them and say whatever happened to was basically the lead in whatever happened to the bill that said this how come we're you know where are we at on it where did it go are we still looking at it is it going away is it worth pursuing and uh it was interesting we only covered four or five bills um but the one that i i was covering was of course one on hydrogen which was is my favorite my my specialty my passion and uh the bill and i learned i actually learned a lot um studying up to, for this forum, but the bill was, uh, how, uh, was um, how Hawaii Revised Statute 196-10, which actually came after or before the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiatives, but they all came on board around the same time, 2006, 2007, and it had a companion bill which created a hydrogen fund. And to, to make a long story short, um, this uh, 196-10 actually sets up uh, the state headed on a trajectory towards a hydrogen economy. It, it gave this, it, it was, it's in law, it's in law as of 2006 and gave us direction as a state to move forward with hydrogen economy, uh, focusing on the big island and using um, presumably geothermal power to make hydrogen, make hydrogen available for the other islands and to start making available hydrogen for transportation sector, for grid stabilization, all the kinds of things that we talk about today that of course haven't been done yet. That was 10 years ago. And so I was asked to comment on it and, and I, I did. And quite frankly, it's a real uncomfortable discussion because hand in hand with that bill, which basically outlined the plan, was a bill that gave us $10 million to execute the plan. It was a separate piece of legislation, but it was put out there. $10 million was set aside to do hydrogen implementation and also set up some money for investor to attract investors like matching funds for, for venture capitalist type folks. But that money was under a lot of controversy right from the beginning. And the controversy got so ugly, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we had state Senate investigations. We had really nasty accusations. We had a lot of hard feelings. And unfortunately, because the funding part of the bill was so nasty, the rest of the bill was pretty much just tabled and never went anywhere. So since 2009, there has been zero money added to this hydrogen fund to do any of the stuff that's already in law to move Hawaii towards a hydrogen economy, which is sad because we have everybody wringing their hands right now with Donald Trump being elected and how all of our initiatives for clean energy are gonna fall by the wayside because he's poo-pooed climate change. And yet we've had 10 years to get a head start on all the stuff that we should have done in the state, and we haven't. And that's really sad. It's a sad statement on the political will of our legislator and our legislature and our governor. It's a really poor statement about what the rest of us have come to expect and will put up with. The good news is that in the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, <clears throat> the University of Hawaii and HNEI, and also my organization, HCAT, we have all collectively done a whole lot towards fulfilling that bill, but we still have done it without any kind of help from the state legislature in terms of funding. Now recently, uh, last, last session, we did get a bond floated for $1.2 million to design a station for the Department of Transportation, a hydrogen station, and we hope to have that RFP on the road and, and at least get design work done and started. But it's a bond, whereas the $10 million was actually straight revenue money that we could we could put out there and, and actually just spend it the bond we have to pay back so whatever our plan is to use that 1.25 million it has to be paid back to the state 
So a recap from my side, yesterday was a, a kind of an emotional traumatic day for me because I had to bring up a pretty sore subject and be the bad guy. But um, we should have addressed a lot of this 10, 12 years ago and over the last 10, 12 years come up with some great solutions that unfortunately our legislature is at square zero or maybe square one uh, and we have a long ways to go and we wasted 10 years of Hawaii's time moving moving ahead in a clean technology and, and a, a renewable energy resource that we really had the wisdom 10 years ago to implement. So that's my recap from yesterday. Other than that, it was a quick and dirty session. Great speaker from the mainland who played a little bit more sunshine into the, uh, into the equation, which I can summarize by saying uh, the actual financials of using renewables is getting better and better as far as competition against fossil fuel. And as long as the business case gets better and better, uh, the chances are we're going to see more work in the renewable energy side because it makes a good business case. And as long as it makes a good business case, private investors will get there. So regardless of whether the government supports it, makes good policies for it, the private sector will have more and more opportunity to get into that, that vision and move it forward. So no gloom and doom just because we have the Trump Meister coming in as president. We well, should be okay. So with that behind us. Today we have a great guest coming to us from the great state of Montana. I was going to try and Skype him in a couple weeks ago, but he's here in person because we just did a 65% design review for our microgrid in Hickam. And uh, he's here to talk to us today uh, about a, a subject that's really important to me, and that's how we vet the technology that we put in these microgrids. Because as I try and set the example for the Air Force and hopefully for our own Hawaiian Electric Company, uh, picking the right technology to go on our microgrid and making it successful is critical. I, I, I can't make any mistakes. I, I have to pick the best technology I can. And there's a lot of moving parts to that decision. So today we have with us uh, Chris Hergett from uh, Miltech out of the great state of Montana, Montana State University, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, Chris, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. <laughs> And uh, this is not your first trip here. No. You're, you're very familiar with what we're doing. Yeah. Don't uh, get lost sympathy from the coworkers. I have to keep coming out yeah, to Hawaii. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, it's tough, especially in January and February. So okay. what's the temperature in Montana right now? Uh, let's see, just about 12 degrees, I think, oh. last time I checked. And a wind chill of? Uh, probably closer to below zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you guys looking in on YouTube later on, don't give Chris too much heat. Yeah. He did work hard over here. <laughs> So Chris, what got you into Miltech and the kind of work that you're doing? What kind of led you down this path towards where you're at? Well, I got my education in industrial engineering. It was a kind of the, my preferred engineering because there's a lot more people focused, whereas electrical engineer focuses on electrical components and the science behind electricity. A lot of industrial engineering is processes, and one of the major part of processes is people. I think that's a lot more fun to interact with than, than some of the other options, and it's just uh, a little more fulfilling in my opinion. And so that kind of led me out into uh, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership in Montana, which is all about helping okay. small manufacturers across the state. And so I had to travel all over Montana providing engineering support in all sorts of uh, forms and concepts for, the, for just small businesses. And that kind of led me to practice a lot of my engineering principles, especially in manufacturing and industry. And then was, I crossed paths with Miltech because it turns out there are some uh, organizations in Montana that do support the military. And I guess I, I rubbed them the right way because they decided to bring me on board and I got to, I guess, come out to visit you guys in Hawaii as a result. And so I think that's a, a good success story on my end. Well, we're glad you're out here. And, and you know, it's, it's true that um, you know, as, we, as we look at, at the process of selecting these companies, there's, they're not just the technical piece. We're not just looking at the piece of equipment we want to put on our grid. We're looking at how ready for manufacturing is that. Can, when we put in our purchase order to request that, that material or that equipment, can they fulfill the contract? Because we're doing some pretty unique stuff out here and the company has to be able to deliver. At the same time, we want the, the, the cutting edge stuff. And some stuff we're willing to take some risk, and some stuff we really want conservative, you know, solid, not too much risk. So we have those components. Then we have the financial component of the company itself. Is it financially solvent? Does it have a cash flow issue? Is it, is it a publicly traded company or a privately held company? And, and are they stable? If we, if we start putting money in there and giving them money, and then they go bankrupt, it does us no good. We lose the money. We don't get our equipment. 
So it's the technology, it's the capability to physically, do they have a plant to produce at the volume and scale that we need? Do they have the financial stability and the, the long haul? Can they, can they last through our project and give us what we need? Those kind of components come in there. And so that's what we ask you to look for. And to, truth be told, Miltech actually has two touch points in Hawaii, both in D-bed, and one of them is with us doing what you do, but we also have Miltech folks that work with our High Tech Development Corporation in their industrial and manufacturing uh, branch as well. Yes. So, so uh, some of your, your compadres do get to come out here. They can't be totally ragging on you. <laughs> yes. They do get to travel out here as well to work with HTDC and, and MIC up in Manoa. But could you tell us, maybe some, pick some of the things that you've been working on um, maybe one of the one of the things you've been working on for me the batteries and kind of walk us through your selection process and and what Miltech does to look for and screen through the multitude of companies that we have to fill that that requirement. Absolutely. Well, I guess the first obstacle is finding the vendors and manufacturers and companies in the first place. And I, as even though I do have an education in engineering, I don't have the expertise that a lot of people have in renewable energies or batteries or any other kind of technology. There's people who have been doing this their whole lives, longer than I've been alive. And they have a lot more passion for the subject matter than I can. And so it's all, oh, the first step is trying to find that expertise. I'm lucky that with Miltech being part of the chain of command, I've got access to laboratories. And so there's a lot of very passionate people who have, say, been focusing their whole lives on batteries. And so once I can find these people, they're the ones who, who let me know what questions I should be asking, what organizations I need to be seeking out, and, more, and just as importantly, what organizations I need to be avoiding. Because you know, a lot of it is marketing as opposed to the ability to provide. And so I'd say once you get the first piece of the experts, that's when you can actually begin searching for the technologies. And a lot of it is getting on the phone and trying to get names and phone numbers of people who can answer your questions and point you in the right direction. And so once you make that connection, then they have to be willing to open up their business to you. Just like you mentioned, we need to be able to determine their financial uh, capabilities, make sure they're going to be around. Uh, some of the businesses that I talked to six months ago trying to find a battery, they went out of business within, between then and now. And so a lot of that comes to when you're a new, interesting and novel technology, you're probably a startup organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same problems every startup has. Once the, once the cash flow stops, so does your technology. And so one of our major steps is to try to find out some of your basic financials like debt to asset ratios, if you're making revenue and profits and those kind of uh, topics. So you do like a Dun & Bradstreet kind of review of their, their financials? Yes, research. that's actually one of the things we ask if they have their Dun & Bradstreet okay. uh, con uh, numbers and identification. And okay, I tell you what, I know there's a lot more to go. We're going to take a quick break here and uh, come back in 60 seconds and uh, we'll get into the rest of the details on, on your, your search through the company. Absolutely. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to youtube.com, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Good afternoon. Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here with Chris Hergut from Miltech in the great state of Montana, big sky country, in case you were wondering. And what, what, what was their state flower? The Oh, doggone it, I was going to remember that. I, I always do my homework for this stuff, and I totally, totally trashed it this time, Chris. But anyway, um, we were talking about the, what you do to vet these companies. We talked a little bit about the technical side. You go to the labs, 
you get a good sort of which companies maybe you should focus on. <clears throat> and then you look at their financials. And then what's the rest of the process? Well, once we find organizations that we have confidence that they're going to be around and actually be able to provide for the microgrid, we have to kind of, I guess, down-select. We can't just try to get 100 companies trying to send us a battery. So that's when a lot of what uh, defines engineering is placing constraints and finding those exact metrics in which uh, will best fill the scope of work. And so a lot of that's working with the design team, in this case, uh, HCAT and Burns McDonnell. And so a lot of our uh, decision criteria comes from what do these people need to fulfill the requirements to make a microgrid. And so we get constraints. Like say, we want a very stable, well-developed technology for this first portion. You might want to stick to something like lithium ion, which is nothing new and uh, mind-blowing, but it's something that there's a lot of uh, uh, research behind, they've been used in lots of microgrids beforehand. So right away, that cuts out a lot of the manufacturers we identified in the first place. And then on top of that, there is the wattage requirements. If you're measuring in the megawatts, all of a sudden, a lot of these uh, other uh, businesses, they can't produce a battery to that, to that, that scale. level. Yeah. Yeah. And so that slowly narrows down until you get a handful, maybe, if you're lucky if you get a dozen, but typically around, like this last time around, it was about three vendors that we thought might be able to provide something that's been developed, that they can produce quick, uh, quick enough to make it into the microgrid and still perform to what the expectations are. Being that a lot of your work is military related, whether it's, uh, and a lot of it, I, hear, I guess, is with the Marine Corps and the Army as well. Um, in the overall company scheme of things, not so much for our grid, but um, then you have the Buy America issues and, and usually try and look for American companies first. Um, do you ever have to look at foreign companies or is that is that also in your repertoire? Yeah, well, a lot of uh, good renewable energies uh, so, uh, products come from Australia or, mm -hmm. or in Europe. There's a lot of focus too. And so with Buy American, it's really tough to find people that can actually meet those requirements. And even worse yet is even if they are American companies, especially if they're new companies, their manufacturing isn't done in the United yeah. States. Yeah. A lot of it's like coming out of Singapore or China or South America. And so not only does that make it harder to procure, but it also kind of uh, violates some of our criteria of we want American produced equipment. Mm -hmm. So, so in our microgrid, we've, we've kind of divided the uh, requirements of uh, the kinds of equipment we want into three major categories. Energy storage, which is where the batteries roll in. Um, power production, so maybe even fuel cells and uh, waste energy plant, um, maybe something like uh, uh, a, a diesel gen set or, or some generator that runs off some synthetic fuel or something. So those are our three big categories. And on the energy storage side, we have, we have batteries. And of course, I'm going to tell you, you got to use hydrogen anyway. So, yes. so have you, have you, has Miltech done a lot of work in, in the hydrogen area? And, and what's some of the research that you've done so far on the hydrogen energy storage side or the power production side? with fuel cells. Do you guys feel comfortable looking at that stuff? Absolutely. And again, it comes down to we have surround ourselves with a lot of experts in the subject matter. Like there's a lot of things I wouldn't, personally wouldn't have considered, especially when it comes to where do you store hydrogen. You just can't put it into any hydrogen, ta uh, into any tank like you would store air or propane. Hydrogen is one of the smallest, or the smallest molecule or atom. Mm -hmm. And so you need uh, welds that will hold hydrogen. So you just can't get any sort of structure to hold this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so luckily I had the experts that told me, no, you're looking in the wrong place. And then there's a lot of ways to produce hydrogen, whether it be through uh, electrolyzers or hydrolyzers. And then of course there's different ways to uh, turn hydrogen into energy, like you mentioned, fuel cells, and then there's a lot of you know, cutting ed edge technologies or people who are trying to make internal combustion engines that run on hydrogen as opposed to mm -hmm. petrol. Okay, so the energy storage we've got covered, power production is pretty, pretty straightforward actually for the most part. The energy controls, we, we, have we actually pressed you guys into looking for energy controls or 
Burns McDonald is still kind of working through a lot of those details, right? Yes. Well, it, with energy controls, a lot of it might be determined by the proprietary uh, controllers that Burns McDonald is comfortable with because they've been making microgrids for a really long time and they've got a really good handle on what they like in controllers. A lot of it's also dictated by the energy storage. If it's uh, energy is being stored in a battery, a lot of times that battery might influence what the controller will be. Okay, I got and, it. And then uh, we are prepared to, we've been, we, we have an inkling that controllers were going to be on the next, uh, the next in queue for right. us to be searching for. As we go more into the smaller microgrids. Yes. Okay. And so we do have that uh, in queue and ready to begin the search. And we've been working with our, again, with our experts to make sure we're ser searching for the right uh, questions to answer. Okay. Well, one of the things that, and, and I've talked to several people that do a lot of uh, technology work in Hawaii, of course, as part of the show. And one of the things that I, I sometimes like to talk about is how culturally sensitive um, our society here in Hawaii is with, uh, you know, we're the only state that came from a monarchy. Uh, we have a fairly vocal, um, local Hawaiian um, cultural um, constituency. Uh, and rightfully so. I mean, this is their native land, and and this is where their their relative their ancestors uh, practice their ancient traditions and things like that. And and so we, you know, we expect that we should be culturally sensitive to the time, kinds of technology and the and what we bring into the state. Um, like I, I don't think you'll ever see nuclear power in Hawaii as a power production thing, just because culturally it, it would just not go over well at all in our whole. Uh, I just can't even imagine it happening. It's so foreign. Although a, a good portion of the electricity generated on the mainland, 20, 30 percent is, is uh, nuclear power. But Montana is actually a lot like Hawaii, other than you don't have many beaches and it gets a little <laughs> colder. Um, and you got big mountains, but so do we. We got some pretty big mountains in the state with snow on top, by the way. Yes, I did see that. Yeah, I actually saw some last weekend. But, um, but you also have a, a large uh, Native American population. Uh, and the sa about the same size overall population as the state of Hawaii. Um, in Montana, uh, does Montana have the same uh, kind of cultural sensitivities that, that we face here in Hawaii? And, uh, and, and how do you guys address those things when you're trying to do these kind of projects in Montana? Yes. Well, there's a lot that goes into uh, the cultural sensitivities. Well, for one, uh, you know, uh, the first societies in Montana were, you know, the indigenous people. And there's a lot of politics that go into it and the nature of reservations and everything along that line. There's the preservation of culture, which I don't think we're necessarily doing a very good job of. And then there's, you know, I think there are still prejudices as well that I don't quite see as, maybe perhaps it's out here in Hawaii, but it seems a lot more accepting of uh, the mixture of cultures and assimilation where that's very segregated, it feels like, in Montana. And so, as far as like how energy applies to that, uh, there's not a lot of need for like cheaper or more prevalent energy sources, but there is a lot of concern for its impact on nature because most of Montana is the fourth largest state with only a million people spread across it. So a lot of it's all trying to protect the beauty of the state. That's one of the main drivers. Mm -hmm. And so, like Glacier National Park, which used to have hundreds of glaciers, is now down to just a dozen, and that's not going to last for more than a couple decades. And that's also in the center of some of the largest Native American populations. And so our careless use of energy has almost completely removed their, uh, what was, what you would think as a historic Native, uh, you know, scenery. Mm. Well, uh, I don't know if you, uh, this is a total surprise to you, because I haven't prepped you for it, but uh, how, is, how is Montana doing in terms of renewable energy? And I mean, do you guys have hydroelectric that you're able to capitalize off of as uh, renewable energy? Or um, what are some of the energy sources that your electric utilities use? Well, there is hydroelectric because we do have access to reservoirs and large lakes. And so a lot of that does power Montana. But unfortunately, I'd say the majority of our power comes from coal still. It's one of the major industries. It's one of the major employers. And a lot of people fear that by replacing coal with another energy source is the same as kicking aside hardworking families and stopping them from being able to provide. Mm. And so there's a lot of, I guess, fear that keeps us uh, attached to our coal factories and our coal plants. And it's probably pretty universal. I mean, 
Hawaii's fear of uh, not having fossil fuel around doesn't help us either. Uh, we have a lot of people that work at refineries and gas stations and things like that that probably have those same fears. They don't do coal mining in Montana. Oh, no, uh, but coal. But, but all the coal power plants and yes. things like that. Okay. Um, and we do have wind turbines, but not near enough to provide energy to the larger cities in Montana. Okay. And you have enough space for them. Yes, we definitely um, do. But unfortunately, uh, weather makes it a lot more difficult for photovoltaics and solar, true. for wind. It's very inconsistent. Pretty far north. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, does uh, Montana have any special plans to move uh, away f uh, from coal and more have more in renewable resources on board? Or it, they'd it's like a, to? It's a kind of a pipe dream right now? It, it, it's a hostile political climate on okay. that. There's a lot of people who want to the immediate security of coal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who know that the way uh, that, uh, you know, history's kind of, the trend is showing us with politics that we're going to slowly move away from coal and, you know, restrictions, making it more expensive. And it's going to really force Montana's hand into being reliant on different energy sources. Okay. Well, it's good for us, too, as part of this show, to see what other states are facing in terms of challenges with renewable energy. And, you know, we're in Hawaii, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we import all our energy, and yet at the same time, we, we're sitting really close to the equator compared to every other state, so we should get plenty of sunshine all year round. We don't have long winter nights like you guys do in Montana. Um, and we should be able to use a lot more renewable. Uh, we pay a huge price for the fossil fuels we import because we don't have coal, we don't have natural gas, we don't have oil. We, don't, we have to bring all that stuff in to generate our electricity. So we're in a whole different ball game compared to a lot of the states on the mainland. And I'd say probably that would roll over even into your transportation sector, right? Yeah because there's not a whole lot of impetus for you guys to switch off of gasoline either. No. Okay. Well, it's hard to justify an electric vehicle, with, especially with the distances you have to travel in Montana. When, you, when yeah. we don't measure in miles, we measure in hours how that's you right. get from that's location right. that's, to location. That's a big state. I keep, yeah, that is a big state. And that's it. We have the same problem on the Big Island, by the way. Uh, electric vehicles on the Big Island, I mean, you can easily drive an hour, hour and a half between major locations. and. A lot of those little vehicles, you know, <laughs> yeah. and some of it's uphill. That doesn't help your electric vehicle much at all. Well, anyway, Chris, thanks for being here today. We've actually come up against uh, our half hour already. So I'd like to thank you for coming out all the way from Montana and talking to us a little bit about industrial engineers and what they do, how they help us make good choices on our grid, and sharing a little bit about Montana and the energy uh, situation in Montana with us. We thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. It was an honor. Thank it's you. It's great to, great to have you here, and uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time you come back for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And tell all those people that give you a bunch of grief to <laughs> chill out. Yes. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, being with us on uh, my lunch hour today, and uh, we'll be back with you next week, Friday, noon times, every, every Friday at noon. I'll be here. Trust me. If I have to be here in a stretcher, I'll be here. But uh, thanks for being with us here at Think Tech Hawaii and Stan Energy Band. We'll see you next week. Aloha.